It's good to be here this morning with you guys. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's John. I uh, serve as one of the pastors. Uh, and our church exists for the simple purpose of uh, glorifying God by making disciples. We say this week after week after week. And some weeks we say it two times uh, in the very same sermon. But this is why we're here. Uh, we're here to make much of Jesus and, and to help other people follow after him. And so if you're a guest with us this morning, uh, whether you are uh, in the room here or whether you're watching online uh, or recording after the fact, uh, we're get, glad that you're here and uh, we hope that you feel welcomed and encouraged this morning. Uh, we would love to come and lo- walk alongside you in any way that we can. And so as you strive to, to know Christ and follow after Christ, uh, if we can be of any help in that, uh, and I think we can be, uh, we would love to come alongside and walk that journey with you uh, because we are walking it ourselves as well. Well, as of this morning, we are four weeks into our four-week series uh, looking at the most popular Christmas carols uh, and how they point us to Christ. Uh, While these songs are not on the same level as Scripture itself, uh, they do echo many of its themes, and at times they sometimes even quote its exact words. And so this is one of the very, one of the main reasons I believe that these songs have been so uh, dearly treasured by God's people and even people who are not believers uh, throughout history uh, because they are saturated with Scripture. And so in this way, we have been blessed by them. We've been blessed to to look at them because they so beautifully remind us uh, in poetic form what this season is all about. It's all about the one who was born. And they all point us to him in their own unique uh, and beautiful ways. And so in case you've missed any of the weeks leading up to now, uh, we have looked so far at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel three weeks ago uh, with Pastor Bill. Uh, We looked at, O Come All Ye Faithful, two weeks ago. And then last week, we looked at, O Holy Night. Now, if any of these happen to be favorites of yours, uh, or you just want to know a little bit more about the stories behind these songs and maybe even the scriptures that lay behind them, uh, all of those recordings are up on the website uh, as a resource for you. Uh, Advent is a word that comes from Latin. Uh, I would venture a guess that none of us know Latin, uh, but that's okay. We don't have to. Uh, That word simply means and refers to arrival. So Advent means arrival. Uh, And so during this season, we look to the past uh, and we celebrate the fact that Christ has already come, uh, which is what we celebrate at Christmas. Uh, But during this season, we also remind ourselves that we look to the future, to the future day when Christ uh, will come again uh, to make all things new. And so at Christmas, we remember that not only has Christ come, Uh, We we also remind ourselves that as certainly as he has come once, he will indeed come again. And that's such an encouragement, such a comfort to uh, us as his people. Uh, And and really to the Christian, this brings more joy to us uh, than any tree wrapped up and put under a tree, doesn't it? Uh, Because while we may all have Christmas lists and and maybe hoping for one particular gift this year, Uh, The reality of it is, is if not a week from now or a month from now or 10 years from now, uh, we will likely forget getting that gift. Uh, But for those who have trusted in Christ, we will never forget the greatest gift that was ever given, uh, Jesus Christ himself. And so um, this season is a reminder that we have a Savior uh, who is wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid down in a manger uh, so that one day he would be crowned with thorns and then lifted up on a cross. And so as we remember uh, the Christmas season and as we look to the manger, we should always have our eye on the cross, which is looming large behind it. Uh, And even beyond that, uh, the empty grave. Well, this morning's sermon is based on a song that we sang just a moment ago. Uh, It's called Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Maybe you've heard it before. Uh, If not twice, at least once just a moment ago. Uh, In my opinion, this carol is one of the most beautiful ones. Uh, because it so beautifully reminds us and captures so many of Scripture's predominant themes. Uh, So in this song, we see peace and mercy and joy. We see glory, worship, and adoration. We see God and sinners and reconciliation between the two. These are rich biblical themes. And so this is a song, most importantly, about the Savior. But it's also about the salvation He brings, and it's about the sinners who receive Him. And who along with these angels sing glory to the newborn king. This carol was written in 1739 by a man named Charles Wesley. 
Uh, maybe you have heard of him before. Uh, he and his brother John uh, later became the co-founders of the Methodist Church, Methodism. Uh, and so Charles is sometimes referred to as the forgotten Wesley uh, because John occupied a more public role um, due to his preaching. Uh, but regardless, both of these brothers contributed in, in their own unique way. Uh, John by his preaching, uh, and then Charles by his hymn writing. In fact, over the course of his life, Charles wrote over, catch this, 6,000 hymns. 6,000. And so when you uh, factor in his conversion around the age of 30, and then his death later at the age of 80, uh, what this means, and, and I'm not a math whiz, so I could be wrong here, but by my math, what, what I come up with in terms of a calculation is that on average, this man wrote one hymn every three days of his adult life. So any artists in the room, songwriters, singer-songwriters, um, that's incredible. It's crazy, but this is the kind of guy that Charles was. Uh, he always seemed to just have like a song marinating in the back of his mind. Uh, even when he was riding on horseback, uh, he was known uh, for stopping at houses along the road, uh, knocking on the doors, and then asking the people inside for pen and paper so that way he could write down the lyrics to the hymns that he was coming up with while riding a horse. Uh, and so it's crazy. And you think about texting and driving being difficult nowadays. Uh, don't do that. But he didn't do that either. He did the right thing. He pulled off. He parked his horse, and then uh, he wrote down what he wanted to write down. So uh, if nothing else, don't text and drive. That's one good takeaway today. Very practical. Well, story has it that this particular carol uh, came to Charles, uh, not while he was riding a horse, uh, but while he was walking to church in London on Christmas morning a year after his conversion. Um, he heard these church bells ringing in the background, and the story goes that he was just inspired uh, by them and motivated by them to compose this carol. Uh, but not the song, not the carol, uh, exactly as we know it today, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Charles loved it when people sang and, and even uh, shared uh, his songs that he had written. Uh, but one thing he didn't like so much uh, was when people took the songs that he had wrote uh, and then altered them, changed them, tried to improve upon them on their own, and then, uh, you know, pass it off as if Charles himself had written it. Uh, this irked him. It bugged him. It irritated him. Uh, so much so that his brother uh, later on felt the need to address it in the preface of one of their published collections of hymns. Uh, here's what he said, and on the screen is a snapshot uh, of that uh, page. He says, Here I beg leave to mention a thought which has long been upon my mind, and which I should long ago have inserted in the public papers, had I not been unwilling to stir up a nest of hornets. He says, Many gentlemen have done my brother and me, though without naming us, the honor to reprint many of our hymns. Now they are perfectly welcome to do so, provided they print them just as they are. But I desire they would not attempt to mend them, for really they are not able. None of them is able to mend either the sense or the verse. Therefore, I must beg of them one of these two favors, either to let them stand just as they are, uh, to take them for better or for worse, or to add, to the, tr or add the true meaning in the margin uh, or at the bottom of the page. And I love this. He says, that we may no longer be accountable either for the nonsense or for the doggerel. This means the worthlessness uh, of other men. I love that. It's great. I would have loved to meet, uh, meet these brothers. But uh, uh, so as is obvious from that quote, these Wesley brothers apparently were tired, uh, exhausted, if you will, uh, for, of people crediting them or rather blaming them uh, for their poorly written paraphrases uh, that bore their names. They were sick of this. And so I imagine that if you wrote a song or wrote a book or something like that or a poem even and then somebody hijacked it, tweaked it and then made it a lot worse and then tried to pass it off as your work, uh, you'd be a little bit irritated too. Uh, but one such remix to this song, uh, one such remix to this carol uh, was really anything but sloppy. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that actually gets the credit for solidifying this carol's popularity. It came at the hand of one of, Wesley's, uh, one of the Wesley brothers' own dear friends. Don't you love that? Uh, the famous evangelist and reformed preacher, George Whitfield. Whitfield loved this hymn, uh, which Charles had simply titled, 
hymn for Christmas Day. Uh, but Whitfield didn't love the opening two lines, uh, which as they stood read, Hark, how all the welkin rings, glory to the king of kings. Now, welkin was not an uncommon word at that time. It certainly is today. Uh, people back then would have understood it uh, as a way to refer to the heavens uh, in the sense of the sky. Uh, but Whit- Whitfield thought that he could do better. And so, uh, you know, contrary to his friend's wishes, uh, he reworked it. And he came up with Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And as they often say, the rest is history, isn't it? Despite the Wesley uh, brothers' best efforts, uh, it was Whitfield's version that stuck. And it's, why, and, it, and it's why we know it by the title today, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, not Him for Christmas Day. And so while this, um, and, and so as a side note too, I'll say this and then we'll move on. I think it's really ironic a lot of times how when you find this song, like in a hymnal or even online, you see it often attributed uh, to, to Wesley. Uh, but it bears uh, the revision of uh, Whitfield. And so I just think that's funny. Uh, Wesley did not want anybody else crediting him with an alternate version, but yet that's precisely what often happens in the hymnals. So I think it's funny. Uh, So while this carol's uh, title, its opening verse, and its chorus all together remind us of passages like Luke chapter 2, which we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, with its mention of the angels appearing before the shepherds uh, in the nighttime sky, Uh, The other verses of this carol, especially uh, the second verse, point us to no better place than the opening chapter of John's gospel. And so if you have that, if you have a Bible with you, uh, I invite you to turn in it with me uh, to John chapter 1. And then once you find your way there, uh, and if you're able to do so, would you please stand to your feet with me in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. There's a lot packed in this beautiful passage we're about to see, and uh, my hope is we'll be able to dive into it a little bit in the time that we have uh, this morning. Hear the word of the Lord, as found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and then continuing on to verse 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything made Uh, that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from the fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side He has made him known. This is God's word. You may be seated this morning. I was talking to Arla about this passage and really about this series a few weeks ago and uh, was sharing with her about uh, which passages we would look at in each week. And uh, one of the difficulties in this series as we look at all these different carols is so many of them point us to places like Luke chapter 2 or Matthew chapters 1 and 2, and rightfully so, because those are beautiful passages that are go-tos when it comes to Christmas and the Christmas story. Matthew, like we saw last week, alone tells us about the wise men. Uh, Luke alone tells us about these shepherds, and they paint a picture of the nativity story in such a beautiful, poetic way. And so it's understandable to go there. 
But one of the challenges has been is that because they're so poetic and beautiful, many of the Christmas carols we sing and love and cherish uh, allude to these passages in Matthew and in Luke. But what makes this particular carol unique, and one of the things that I think makes it most beautiful, is not so much the first verse, which does point us to places like Luke chapter 2, but instead the second and the third verse, especially the second verse, and what it shows us and tells us about this baby who was born in Bethlehem. Matthew and Luke both tell us a lot about this baby, but they only, you know, so to speak, and this is the uh, example Arla gave to me, these, these two other gospel writers only, only kind of give us the tip of the iceberg. But John, in contrast, takes us below the surface, and he shows us so much more about this Savior who has been born. He is the Word. And so I'm looking forward to being able to hopefully unpack that a little bit this morning. Uh, in these verses, and, and this is how I want us to approach this passage, I want us to approach this passage um, as an answer to the question, who is Jesus? Who is he? Who is this one that Matthew and Luke and now John himself tell us about? Wesley does the very same thing in his carol uh, when he points out specifically in verse 2 so many beautiful things about this word. And so let's dive in. In verses 1 through 8, John gives us the first part of his two-part answer to the question, who is Jesus? Uh, and he does this when he tells us in, in definitive terms, Jesus is God. He is God. Charles Wesley puts it this way in the carol. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Such a beautiful line. At the beginning of his book, what John does is he, he, he takes us all the way back to the beginning of the book, the Bible itself. John chapter 1, verse 1, echoes the, the, and really almost directly quotes Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And so as familiar as John's original readers would have been with the scriptures, they would have expected John at this point to say, in the beginning, God. But that's not what John says. Instead, he says, in the beginning was the Word. At first, this may have struck them as a strange substitution. But by the end of verse 18, they will understand, hopefully just like us, that this really wasn't much of a substitution at all. To put it simply, uh, John was speaking their language. This word that he speaks of, uh, he's using this word uh, as an, an effective missionary, right? And so he is communicating and he's taking this concept of Jesus being the word, and he's communicating the gospel using this term. He's using this term uh, to bring the gospel to a people from a wide diversity of backgrounds and cultures. Uh, and so he's, he's speaking their language, so to speak, the language of that day. Uh, he may not be speaking our language, uh, per se, uh, because this language kind of confuses us, uh, but he was speaking their language. So we may struggle to understand the significance of Jesus being this word, uh, but John's original readers would not have shared in that struggle with us. Uh, because in Greek culture, as well as in Greek philosophy, this word, or logos in Greek, was an immaterial force. It was an impersonal principle uh, that was behind everything and governed uh, everything. Uh, and John was aware of this, but he does not affirm it. He does not say, yeah, that's 100% right. Instead, he takes the term and he redefines it in light of the truth of God's word. And so according to John, the word that he speaks of was not some impersonal principle. Rather, it was a person. This immaterial word, John will go on to say in verse 14, took on the material. This word was not an it like Greek philosophy taught. Instead, as scripture teaches, this word was a he, Jesus Christ. God himself in human flesh. John goes on in these verses to give us six characteristics of Jesus as the word. And so we're, for the most part, we're going to breeze through these very quickly. Number one, the word is eternal. He's always existed. Uh, here's how John says it. He says, in the beginning was the word. John takes us back as far as we can possibly conceptualize in our minds. And at that precise place, he says, the word is was already there. It was already in existence. It was already there. And so unlike Mark, 
uh, who begins his gospel talking about Jesus' ministry, or Luke, who begins his gospel talking about Jesus' birth, or even Matthew, who begins his gospel writing about Jesus' ancestry. John begins by taking us all the way back, further than the other three of them, taking us all the way back to the beginning and showing us that throughout history, throughout eternity, this word, this Jesus, always was. New Testament scholar uh, D.A. Carson, he, he offers this paraphrase. He says, Mark has told you about the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. I want to show you that the starting point of the gospel can be traced farther back than that, before the beginning of the entire universe. Now, back in the third century, uh, there was a heretic by the name of Arius, uh, and he argued that Jesus was not eternal, but instead came into existence at a certain point in time. Uh, He famously said there was a time when he, meaning Jesus, was not, meaning not in existence. But in response, as people in in the church did back then, uh, there was a pastor by the name of Athanasius who stood up and said, yeah, that's, that's, that's not what I'm seeing here in the Word. And so he said, those who maintain there was a time when the Son was not rob God of His Word like plunderers. And so he takes Arius' exact words and he says, that right there is wrong. And when those people that say that, they're robbing God of his own word. And so with Scripture squarely on his side, Athanasius eventually won the debate. And the matter was largely settled. And the word is, as, as Wesley puts it here, the everlasting Lord. He is eternal. Even in the beginning, he already was. Number two, the word is relational. John says the word was with God. This is the language not merely of like proximity, but of relationship. Uh, There is a certain closeness between God the Son and God the Father, a closeness that both unites them together but then also distinguishes them from one another. Number three, the word is divine, or as, as Wesley says it, he is incarnate deity. Not only was the word with God, he also was God. So throughout Christian history and even up until the present day, there have always been some who believe mistakenly, that Jesus is not the God, but rather only a God, one among many others. Jehovah's Witnesses are a modern-day example of this mistake. In their version of the Bible, which is called the New World Translation, they inaccurately translate this verse to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. No problem there so far. But then it goes on to say, and the Word was a God. But that is not what John says. In this verse, John distinguishes the Word and God, but he also unites them together. This is the mystery of the Trinity, of our triune God. Now, our finite minds may be unable to fully comprehend it in all of its complexity, but this concept ought to lead us to adoration, praise, and worship. It should prompt us to respond in praise to God. Number four, the Word creates. Here's what John says in verse 3. He says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul picks up on this himself in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, when he writes, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created, not only through him, but also for him. Everything that exists owes its existence to Christ and his creativity. In Genesis, creation comes into existence through the word of God being spoken. Here, John says, Jesus is that word. He creates, but number five, he also sustains. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is not only the originator of life, he is also the sustainer of life. And in the very next verse of Colossians, uh, the very next verse from the one we just read, Paul says the very same thing. He says, and he is before all things. Sounds like John 1 to me. And in him all things hold together. He sustains it. And then finally, number six, the word saves. In calling him both light and life, John is calling attention to the fact that Christ reveals God, exposes sin, 
and calls each and every one of us to make a decision. In verses 6 through 8, John the Baptist himself bears testimony to this effect. Throughout John's gospel, Jesus frequently draws a contrast between himself as light and sin as darkness. And so here's a sampling of three verses. Chapter 3, verse 19. Jesus says, and this is the judgment. And mind you, this comes just a few verses after the very well-known verse, John three sixteen. He says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And then chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then lastly, chapter 12, verse 36, where Jesus says, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Christ came not only to expose our darkness, but to call us into into the light of his salvation. He came not only to show us our sin, but to save us from it. And so this morning before Christmas, can I just ask you all this morning, and it's mostly familiar faces, but can I just ask you, and don't think I'm just asking somebody else, but, but have you believed in this Jesus? Not a shallow or watered down version of Jesus, not one that is uh, petty and weak and incapable, but one who is the sovereign Lord of all the universe, who by nothing but his own word, uh, the nations and, and, and all of the universe came into existence in a moment. Have you believed in this Jesus, this one that John shows us and tells us so much about? Because we can spend the light, uh, uh, our entire lives plumbing the depths of who this, this Jesus is, and we will never arrive at a full or complete understanding of him because he is God. He escapes our full comprehension. We can know him partly and we can know him reliably, but we will never know him fully. That is what we get to do throughout eternity, coming to get to know our God more and more. And so have you believed in this Jesus? Christ, as the word, is eternal. He's relational. He's divine. He's the creator, the sustainer, and the savior. And so what are we to do with all of this? Well, I love the way Bruce Milne answers that question. He says, if Jesus Christ shares the nature of God, that's his way of saying, if Jesus is God, then we are called to worship him without cessation, obey him without hesitation, love him without reservation, and serve him without interruption. I think it's so beautiful and so very true. In verses 9 through 18, John gives us the second part of his answer to the question, who is Jesus? He says, not only is Jesus God, he is also God with us. God with us. Here's how Wesley brings this out so beautifully in the carol. He says, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Notice, though, that that John doesn't start here, does he? He doesn't start there because... Before he even gets to the incarnation, John has to tell us first in lofty terms about who this Christ is. For us to understand the significance of what it means for this word to come into our world and to dwell among us, we at first have to understand who the word is. And so that's where John starts. Because we have to understand not only the significance of his coming, we also have to understand and appreciate the significance of the one who has come. He is God, and yet he has come for us. He's come for us. Until you and I have a clear picture of who Christ is, we will never be able to understand or appreciate or respond accordingly to the significance of what, the, what symbolizes the Christmas season. When you consider how sinful, how rebellious, how wicked and twisted we have all become, you would expect God to either abandon us, counting us off as a lost cause, or coming in in order to exact judgment against us for all the wrongs we have ever done against him. But John doesn't say he does either of these two things. John says that he came not to issue a verdict of condemnation, but to offer the gift of salvation to each and every one who would believe in him. 
This is the focus of verses 9 through 13, where John highlights two responses to Christ when he came. Many people rejected him, John says, but some, some received him. John says it this way in verses 11 through 13. He says, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, that's how you receive him, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's supernatural. It's not natural. And yet, as John will unfold in the rest of his gospel, he shows us that many of God's own people, many of Jesus' own uh, kin, refused him. More than any other person, the Jews should have recognized and received him. But instead, they rejected him. And I think Bruce Milne is helpful here too. He says, in spite of all the centuries of waiting for their promised Messiah, when at last he appeared, they not only dismissed his claim, but instigated his destruction. And then he goes on and he says, There is no ground here, however, for pointing the finger. For in all of this, Israel only typifies the folly of the human heart universally. The continuing widespread rejection of Christ in our generation is a daily witness to the universal rebellion against the living God. Like the Jews, we all, at one time or another, have chosen and, and, and have chosen to reject this Christ rather than receive him. Instead of the light, we preferred the darkness. Instead of choosing the Savior, we chose to stick with our sin. The world did not receive him. The world did not welcome him, even though it expected him. And that's why it's so sad. I was thinking about this this morning, and what came to my mind is, you know, one of my favorite things to do these days, since we're spending so much time at home still, and thankfully things are opening up more and more, but as we're still spending significant time at home, I found that one of my favorite things to do is simply to come home. Uh, whether I'm at a church meeting or running an errand real quick or whatever the case may be, grabbing coffee with somebody, um, as soon as I get home, that's what I look forward to. Uh, because I know when I, when I pull into the garage and that garage door comes down and then I get out of the car and I open the, the, the door into our house, um, oftentimes I've been talking to Arla on my way home and so she knows I'm coming. She's expecting me to come. And the girls likewise know that mommy is talking to Dada. And so when I come home, uh, what I love is opening that door because more often than not, uh, not only my daughters, but also my wife is so ready and so eager to welcome me home with open arms. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And when it doesn't happen, uh, I know something's not quite right. And I, I would say, you know, the same is the case here. Jesus came home, so to speak to his own people. They expected him. They were on the phone with him, so to speak. They had God's word, and they knew that a Messiah was coming. But when he walked in the door, they did not greet him with open arms. Instead, they greeted him, or met him, rather, with closed hearts, cold and closed hearts. And so this morning, can I also ask you, what is the posture of your heart towards Christ? Is it open, ready, and eager to receive him? to celebrate him during this season? Uh, or is it closed? Is it callous? Is it cold towards him? Because John is, is trying to show us in this passage not to be like that. Not to be like the people who reject him, but instead to be the one, among the ones who receive him. Christ came to the world that he himself had created, but many in that world wanted nothing to do with him. This was true back then, and tragically it remains true for many today. We live in a culture that celebrates Christmas, but not Christ, at least not in the way that the Bible presents him to us. In these verses, John issues us an invitation. Do not reject him. Receive him. And by believing in his name, become a child of God, all by the grace of God. In the final section, verses 14 through 18, John unpacks for us the manner in which Christ came as well as the result of his coming for all those who received him, which John says is grace upon grace. He says in verse 14, and this is what we'll focus on as we prepare to close. 
He says, in the word. This same word that was mentioned previously all the way back in verse 1, this same word now became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, just a couple verses after the ones we read earlier, he says, in Christ, the fullness of God, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, to dwell. Here in these verses, John says this same Christ, the one in whom the fullness of God dwells, has come to dwell with us. He's come to dwell and be with us. This is such a gracious message. This is such a great news. The God of the universe, the sovereign Savior, has come to dwell among his people. Not to abandon us, not to forget us, but ultimately and truly to come in to save us. And that's what he's done. John says a lot in these verses, but I want us to focus on two things from this particular verse. Verse 14. Number one, he says, The Word became flesh. This word flesh uh, refers to the frailty, to the vulnerability of the human existence and experience. John could have used a more positive term or even a more neutral term uh, like man or like body, but instead he chose to highlight the degree to which Christ condescended in order to identify with sinners. This is how far he came down. He didn't just take our body. He didn't just become a man. He took on flesh. The God of the universe, the Word himself, took on human skin. He took on our weaknesses. He took on our struggles. He took on our difficulties. And ultimately, he took on our sin. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul reminds us of the degree to which Christ humbled himself. And he calls us in that passage to emulate his example. This is what he says. It's not on the screens, but you can listen to it. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, not, not only by being born, but by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. One New Testament scholar gives the following illustration. He says, At times we marvel at missionaries leaving behind the comfort of their homes, extended families, and native cultures for the sake of proclaiming the gospel to an unreached people group. Any such sacrifice, while significant and noble, pales by comparison with the sacrifice of the Word, leaving behind the glory He shared with the Father before the world began. So, the greatest sacrifice that any missionary has made in this world pales in comparison to the distance which Christ has traversed in order to get to us. Christ went from the highest of heavens to the lowest of earth, all for the purpose of saving us. Christ was the sovereign king of the universe, but he was willing to become the suffering servant in order to secure your salvation and my salvation. He came as the greatest missionary ever, not only to proclaim salvation, but to accomplish it. Amen. Because of what he did, you and I can see the reality of which that, that Wesley wrote when he said, God and sinners reconciled. It's one of my favorite lines in this carol. We are not recon reconciled because of what we have done, though. We're rather reconciled because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Number one, the word became flesh. Number two, and this is where we'll close. The word dwelt among us. The word that John uses, dwell, literally means to set up a tent. It means to set it up. Now, I spent a lot of time in Boy Scouts setting up tents and going on camping trips. So I know well what that word means, and you likely do too. Even if you haven't been camping, you've likely seen it happen. But the idea here is you don't set up a tent or set up a, a, a permanent residence unless you plan to stay a while. And so we've all had, probably pre-COVID, had people over where we've said, I'll sit down, stay a while. And this is what John has in mind here when he says that this word dwelled among us. It's the same word used in the Old Testament to refer first to the tabernacle and then to the temple, the places where God's presence literally and tangibly dwelled with his people. John uses this word to make a point, and it's this. In the incarnation, something significant has happened. God has once again, and to a greater degree than he ever has before, come yet again to dwell 
with his people. What, what John says here, really you could, you could consider it when he says the word dwelt among us. You could consider it, you could say the, the word set up shop. He took up residence uh, with us. Or as Eugene Peterson in the, in the message, I, th- I think he says, that the word moved into the neighborhood. And I think those are all accurate. The idea is that Jesus so thoroughly came to identify with us. So that way he could take our sin as a man himself and die for it on the cross. But as a God, as a sinless man, also rise again from the dead. Christ came to the earth not on a vacation. He came instead on a rescue mission. And it's a rescue mission he entered in through a manger. And it's a rescue mission he ultimately accomplished through a cross and through an empty grave. And so this morning, as we prepare to celebrate this this week, we gather with family and possibly friends and celebrate Christmas and all of its significance. I hope that we will have in our minds the question, who is this Jesus? But more important than the question, I pray and I hope that we will have the two answers that John points us to in this passage. Who is Jesus? He is God. But more than that, he is also God with us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word, both written here for us to read, but then also your word that took on flesh. Jesus Christ who came to bear the punishment, to bear the penalty for our sin, and to pay for it in full on the cross. There is no longer any sacrifice. There is no longer anything left to be done uh, except to receive this work that he has done on our behalf. So God, I pray that we with open arms would receive you. That if there are any of those, any here in this room or watching online or even watching the recording after the fact, God, I pray if there are any here uh, listening who are up to this moment rejecting you, God, I pray they would repent, that they would see Christ, not as some mild, uh, weak little infant baby, not as just some merely mere mortal or just a man, but God, they would see him for the fullness that he is, the fullness to which John in this passage points us to. He himself is God dwelling among us, our sovereign Savior coming uh, to secure our salvation. So God, I pray this morning, this week, and during this season that we would all receive him and receive him by believing in him. And as a result, that just like millions before us, that we like them would become children of God. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word. Amen.